There's actually over 300,000 SMEs in the UAE. So if you don't fund uh, SMEs, okay, it's really going to help to be able to grow the economy. You know, Beehive is, was obviously concept originally, moved into startup. And just to give you a background, obviously started in 2014. Um, we initially raised uh, and sold, and, uh, uh, raised capital and, and, and sold off a piece of the company. And that's how we originally did it. Okay, so we are your typical valley of death, very, very steep, okay, but looking for very, very rapid growth in terms of scale. Go back to the original, original point. Where are you in the funding cycle? Are you a concept? Are you a startup? Are you revenue generating? Are you now growing? Think about where you are. Think about the funding options. Okay? The second point is, don't have just one funding option. I've seen many people who, again, they've, they've gone to sell a piece of the company and they've got one investor. Create a bidding war. Look at two, three, four options. And if that means you have to network a bit harder and you've got to graft a bit harder, you'll get more value for your business. But also do keep in mind your strategic piece as well. Okay? Strategic investor is just as important as the money itself. Equity crowdfunding and, and, and peer to peer lending is now de facto. Uh, in the UK, it's the number one mechanism to raise money. Uh, if you're raising less than $5 million in the UK, £5 million in the UK, uh, the number one mechanism of doing that is through equity crowdfunding and, and peer-to-peer -peer lending is a you know, $100 billion business. So, so no longer is this alternative, this is now the way that you should be raising money. If you're an entrepreneur uh, that's looking to raise cash, uh, you have various options open to you. You can go through uh, rewards crowdfunding uh, where you are effectively selling a pre-selling a product or getting donations for your business. Uh, there's debt crowdfunding, so peer-to-peer -peer lending, as, as, as Gavin just explained, which is where you're effectively taking a loan for your business. And there's equity crowdfunding, which is where you are looking to sell equity in your business to a crowd. All we do is put an online system around that process. So our job as a platform is to really hold your hand and, if you like, drag you through that entire fundraising process and help you every step of the way to raise that cash. Because it's online, it's therefore much more efficient, much more transparent and easier. It's very difficult to raise money. It's painful. It's, it's, a, it's a slog. You know, we end up, like I say, knocking on 100 doors, having the same conversation with 1,000 people, and just you know, really finding it very difficult to, to make the right connections with investors globally. Equity crowdfunding platforms like Eureka really give you access to a much larger group of individuals to raise that cash from. But what they also do is, is hold your hand through that journey. So our job as a platform is not only to help you get fit for funding, to so help you with your business plan, your financials, your pitch deck, uh, figure out the right valuation to have, what the right buttons to push with investors. Uh, it's also, once you've got all that right, is then to create a campaign and help you shout as loudly as possible to your network, to your customers, your suppliers, your subscribers, the people that already know and love your business, have an emotional connection with what you do, but also our investors. And, and the louder you can shout, and the more people you can shout to, in the most efficient manner possible, which is, as always, online, the more chance you have of raising the money. Uh, so I'm Marie Christine. I started a company in 2015 called Fruitful Day. Um, so we're about two and a half years old now. Initially, since we're talking about raising funds, I guess I'll focus on that. Um, I started by raising funds from uh, friends, people I used to work with. That got us, you know, that got us through the first year and a half of business. Um, and at that point, we were starting to scale, and we were looking at uh, we were looking at um, where to find funds, or what the best way for, was for us to find funds externally. Um, we're already four partners, so equity investment wasn't something that we really wanted to do because we didn't want to add more people into the mix. Um, so debt was a really great option for us. So I'm a, a founding partner of VentureSuk. Um, it's, a, it's an angel plat platform based in Dubai. We started about four years ago. Um, as Tark mentioned, um, you know, I'll, be, I'll be coming on uh, full-time in, in January. You know, I've been part-time, I guess, which really means full-time evenings and weekends um, over the last number of years. Um, we're based in Dubai. We focus on global tech opportunities, um, so not just opportunities in Dubai, although we do, or the UAE, or even the MENA region. Um, we look at opportunities here. We look at opportunities in the U.S. We look at opportunities 
in Africa, India, you know, other parts of the emerging world. I'm Patrick Rogers. I'm a co-founder and principal of, of Support Legal, the region's first legal services platform that's been custom built with entrepreneurs and emerging companies in mind. So we've taken the traditional law firm model and kind of spun it on its head. We're founded by a team of senior lawyers who are drawn from the world's top law firms. Uh, and now we're bringing that kind of Fortune 500 expertise to bear for the people who can least afford it and the people who are uh, far away from being profitable. Um, as we say in, in our model, we are, we are entrepreneurs serving entrepreneurs. Yeah, my name is Daniel Dostreis. I'm the Senior Portfolio Investment Manager of The Authority. I'm based here in DTEC. Uh, I'm managing the investment portfolio. We have 21 investments among startups like uh, The Luxury Closet, Yala Compare, startups like Clip the Deal who are based here. My day-to-day -day job is end-to-end. -end. That means from, let's say, screening deals, reviewing deals, assessing opportunities, sitting together with founders, negotiating term sheets, writing term sheets, talking to lawyers, putting legal documentation together, doing due diligence. How do you cook a deal that actually you folks will look at it and say, yeah, this is cool, and we'll go forward from that? Because I just see money everywhere, but not enough people are actually getting funded. I think the question really is more about is, you know, is the right money around for the opportunities that are out there? So, and you hear this time and time again, which I still think is true to, to a certain degree, there seems, to be, um, there seems to be enough money around, at least from the deals that we're seeing and the deals that we're doing at the earlier stages of, of a company's funding cycles. You know, there's still a, a huge gap, I think, you know, Series B and onwards, um, which is really where your company goes from a pretty good idea, you know, some revenue um, or, you know, consistent revenue or recurring revenue or at least the opportunity where there's visibility to that to, you know, a growth story that's, that's compelling for bigger investors. You've got to have a runway, right? As an entrepreneur, things never go the way that you think that they're going to go. Um, so you have, you have to be willing to pivot. We've, we've pivot, pivoted a few times in, in, in the couple of years that, that we've run the business, right? And, and, and these investors that I do have, they're extremely supportive and uh, they're... <clears throat> They're a sounding board for new ideas. Having a good team around you is very important and having a runway uh, as well so you don't run out of cash to continue running the business. In the last month or two, we've been sitting with, the, well, we're always sitting with VCs, but we sat with a couple who are specifically developing these early stage arms, which I would, which I would coin as 500 startups-esque. So they are only looking to invest in companies that are pre-revenue. And when you're doing that, you're basically taking a bet on individuals. You're taking a bet on founders and saying, okay, yeah, the idea is okay, it, might, it may or may not work, but these individuals have what it takes to really push the envelope, work those 18-hour days, um, and, and if this idea is going to work, I believe these guys are the ones who can do it. More than likely, it's going to fail, but I'm going for a 10 or 20x return here, so I'm going to sprinkle my bets with small tickets of $50,000 uh, around the region, um, quick resolution financing on simplified documents, and do it that way. So I think that is coming because it has been a void in the market and like anything else, people are going to fill the void because they see an opportunity there. I am a new entrepreneur, very new to the journey. Um, now in order to prepare myself for this journey and what's to come, uh, based on your experience dealing with multiple startups, what would you say are the top three reasons why startups fail? Um, and what could we do to prepare ourselves uh, or, in fact, prevent uh, these things from, from happening or stopping us from our success? One thing that we often see is lack of focus. Um, so we have an entrepreneur coming in, and he is doing from A to Z everything, saying my platform is, uh, we are covering everything. We are the holistic provider. And I think this is the recipe for not success. I think it's about focus, um, knowing exactly what you want to do, and then testing. If it doesn't work, maybe the next thing. Another thing is communication. Um, surprisingly, often, like I said, um, you need to be able to communicate relatively clearly, precise. For me, also a little bit sometimes honest reflection, let's say admitting if something is not working and don't, let's say, don't have this kind of reality distortion field around you and think, okay, I'm Steve Jobs, I will turn this around even if it doesn't fit. I think it's about measuring and, and objectively assessing, do I achieve what I have set, me, set myself as a target? I mean, I, I don't know, there are many reasons why startups fail, right? I mean, the, the fact is there's a, a billion external factors that, and a lot of luck in terms of succeeding, but, but the, the successful entrepreneurs are the ones that persevere. You've just got to stick at it. 
You know, Twitter was an overnight success in year seven, right? I mean, it takes a long time, a lot of iterations, a lot of pivoting, a lot of just, you know, many, many sleepless nights and really a lot of pain to get to where you need to get to. So just persevere. Be naive. If you, if you realize how hard it was, was going to be, you wouldn't be doing it. But just be, you know, persistent. Just persevere. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And you'll get there. If you believe in your, in your product and your, your business, you'll eventually get there. I would just say that I think one of the most important things in terms of entrepreneurship is really understanding uh, the culture of your company and really getting uh, your purpose really, really refined. And uh, we call, in, um, in, in organizational theory terms, it's called the why. If you can really understand why you're doing it, is it to make money, is it to change the world, is it to create a new innovation, and if you really understand that and have your team fully behind that, you empower it. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, is that each one of us has a set of values, either from our religion, uh, from our upbringing and whatnot. If you could take those values and translate them consistently into your product and your purpose, it will empower you in a very, very different way.